Go ahead and get started with this session. I think we're close to time, and even a couple minutes later by my watch, so we might jump into it. I'd like to welcome everyone here today. I'm Aaron Esker with WSU Extension, and the good news for most of you is I'm not going to be talking very much. So that's a plus. That's probably why there's actually people here. Um, I kind of organized this with them. Um, it all started from a field day I had this year, and some girls were sitting around talking about what they're doing with their no-till file and what they're spraying and da 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 and they kept going, is that a good idea or a bad idea? So, I set this up with a panel of three growers who have an awful lot of experience managing and working with no-till file situations, and then I set it up with a panel of university and um, crop people um, to talk about whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea. So, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to give each of the three growers here an opportunity to go over 10 minutes about what they're doing with their no-till fallow management. And then we're going to spend about five minutes to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of their um, herbicide management program. Um, just a quick thing, the first thing you're probably going to notice with my presentation is the term no-till fallow, and this may throw a few people off because you've heard me talk before. I, I do use the term no-till fallow. Um, Oh, there it goes. Um, and I like the, the old terminology I like to use is chemical fallow. And the new terminology I use is no till fallow. And these are herbicides that are used to control weeds. So our fallow stay using chemical fallow. We use no till fallow. And instead of using chemicals to control weeds, we're going to be talking about the herbicides we're using to control weeds. And it's not for this audience, but it's for this audience. So, not for this guy, but for this guy. And it all started, I got on a, on a bus with WSU administrators a long time ago, and I was talking about my, my work, and I was looking at chemical fallow, and so all the wonderful stuff, and they go, chemicals? Yeah. And we're using them to do something. You, you're chemical, what are you doing in the environment? I got into this whole discussion, and I realized I quickly didn't want to be in that discussion and, and stuff. So. So just a little bit of terminology, it is what some of you may know as chemical follow. With that, I'm going to turn it over here to our, our first, oh, just a quick thing. They're going to go through their background, their equipment, their herbicide program, and then tricks. One thing I know about farmers, every one of these guys has a trick. No matter what it is, they have a trick. And so I want to spend a little bit of time to talk about their tricks. And then they're going to talk about what they're concerned about with their no-till follow system. And then the panel's going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Richter, um, Innocop farmer, former president. And take it away. All right. Ten minutes. Okay. Well, thank you for showing up today. Um, like Darren said, I farm in the Endicott, Colfax area. A couple places around uh, central western Whitman County. Uh, oh, you hit rock straight. Don't hit that button. Not that button. Not that button. Hey, this is not technology. It's a button. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when presenters do that. I can't handle this technology. I'm like, it's a fucking projector, people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So I guess that is right exactly where I live, and I farm over here, I farm over by Colfax, up by Stepto, over by St. John, so kind of spread out, but right where Mark Richter says, that's the majority of my ground. That's 18 inch rainfall. West is about 14, Colfax, Stepto areas, 20, 21 inches. So it's quite broad and precipitous. Um, been direct seeding for 18 years. A lot of drill. First year, just dove in 100%. Figured that I wasn't going to learn, uh, you know, any better than just diving in and doing it. Um, so, pulled a couple different drills. Last drill I got, pitcher on the bottom. We built that drill in uh, 2005. Ran it for three years and then built another drill. My neighbor bought that drill. And I'm still on the same road. Uh, Red tough fescue is going to be probably one of my worst weeds. Red grass. I tell you, red grass, um, as far as the grass and weeds, uh, 
And dog kennel, maybe we can have them now. This is probably one of my worst project weeds. I grow wheat, both uh, red wheats, winter wheat, spring wheat, uh, soft white wheat, and some barley, and garbanzo wheat. Uh, sprayer, I run on a rotator. Uh, we kind of modified it. Shorter tires, wider tires, and spread it out and get a nice load to the ground. 100 foot booms, we built aluminum booms for it. Um, makes a lot of difference. Just that about 400 pounds per wing, the lighter for the aluminum. And it gets around on the hills a lot better. We farm up to 45% you know, slope. So it's pretty steep. Another picture of the sprayer. It's broke up into uh, nine boot sections. So anywhere from all um, well, the outside wing is by about five feet, down to the center um, sections are 12 feet or so. Uh, the drill I got set up with all the technology to uh, turn off liquid for six boom sections. My seed is broke up into three sections. Um, did that a year ago just for the seed and it's automatic uh, turn on, turn off. And uh, savings is quite drastic, especially when seed and garbage means like $100 an acre, you want to save as much money as you can. Here's just a picture of looking kind of down the row of uh, the openers. Two row machine. Uh, it's got the flexi coil stealth opener on it with a five inch spread. And it works really good. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, we ran John Deere combines the last 10, 12 years. I have made the change back to red. They're always red, so whether that's good or bad. And Take home here is spread your resume. Very critical. If you, uh, we like to cut the stubble short too, whether that's good, bad. Rob will say you need a stripper head. So um, I'm not sure that my shape through will go through that, so that's I'm always trying to catch up with Rob anyway. He's, he's on the cutting edge. Uh life to say so. 80 to 96 ounces per year is about what I end up using. Uh, three to four applications, anywhere from 24 ounces to 32 ounces, generally speaking. Uh, 10 gallons an acre. Timing. Timing is everything. It kind of depends on what you're trying to go after and when you need to get the spray bottle, you're going you know, back into a spring crop. You want to have that green bridge broke, so we will spray in the fall if we have something to spray. In the last couple of years, we have had, even when you have a late rain and you haven't had any rain after post harvest, if you get a little bit of rain and you might not see there's much out there growing, but I spray, and it makes a difference because you can see your skips. So. Uh, tank mix, as far as glyphosate, I, in the last few years, I have not put anything in with the, with the, uh, I have used Bandel and some 2,4-D mixes, but it seems like it kind of takes the glyphosate, and it doesn't work as good, so we kind of went away from it. Uh, use either AMS or in place, in place is a Wilberellis product. AMS is like a converter product. Another picture of the seed boot. And I run a double fertilizer down there so I can separate pots and bio from my aqua or can run the chloride with the aqua too, but it seems like it's so corrosive in the model. I'm not sure that I want to continue with that product. My biggest concerns is, of course, herbicide resistance. As we uh, get into chemical fallow and trying to take care of all our weeds with with our chemicals, and I haven't got into cover crops and uh, you know more better rotation, one rotation. I'm 
you know, you know, be worried with resistance. And uh, you know, chemistry, as far as coming down the road, it seems like in the past they've uh, all slowed down with some of the chemicals. So it's kind of a struggle, I know you might say. So am I supposed to answer this? No. Well, what do you need your strengths? What are my strengths? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm still farming, I guess. <laughs> still in the game. I can, I can come to meetings like this and learn ways maybe that I could do a better job. From the panel. Um, just a, qu a quick introduction on our um, university experts. I, I didn't do that in the interest of time quite so soon. Over here, I have Larry Lutcher, Oregon State University Extension out of Morrow County. Um, done a lot of research in the past on, on herbicide management in, in no-till valves, especially on the timing of it. And I think you really pointed out to us that early spring application is pretty critical if you want to have seed zone moisture to seed them. Um, I have Ian Burke with WSU, um, weed scientist. He's done like a gazillion trials on, on um, no-till fallow management, just has it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave Barda with um, Crop Protection Services, not CPS that some of you may know of, but Crop Protection Services. Um, he's done a lot of the research on, on their side and works hand-in-hand uh, -hand with a lot of growers and, and has spent a lot of his, his efforts as well working with no till follow um, with different groups. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the expert panel, the quote. And what do you guys, as you were, went through this presentation, what would some of the strengths be with um, what you saw here? I think he's got a really good fertility program. He's got a really good uh, providing of lots of options. And, uh, he's doing a really good job. Side more of the stubble spread and solid cover going in. Fair branch is the recipe for the disaster, so having a little bit of solid cover there. You could cut the stubble higher, lay it down tighter, and you, know, you have to change drills, like I said. That's that concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I drive by it all the time in the street. <laughs> <laughs>
maybe the postmark for size of heart, suppressing it. Right. But it's very unlikely to actually get ahead of it. Yeah, well, right, that will die today. <laughs> You've gone to see. But... <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, you know, some other options you might consider. I know tank mixing is a, it can be a catch 22. It is situational. And uh, many times you get into kind of the heart of the summer and you just find yourself with a problem. So I think going forward here, a lot of you are going to have to, to look at, you should call them alternative chemistries that you would traditionally think of using in your systems that are different modes of actions that you apply at different times of year. And I don't think that's just in Kimpalo, I think that's in, in, in crop as well. Um, pre emerge herbicides that you apply late in the fall or early in the winter, or maybe late winter, early spring, things like Valor. Valor has some activity on Ratfield Fescue as well as the Russian Fiscal Crypto. Yeah, they are costly, but uh, uh, if we don't start incorporating those types of chemistries, we can think we're, we've had a good three years as far as controlling the trees in Kim Valley. And a lot of that has been environmental. And if we're going to go back to hot dry, and that's where we're going to go back to. Where's Valor going to throw rotation? Or you know, chickpeas or or something like that? Yeah. Isn't there some? <clears throat> there, you know, there have been some problems with Valor. Can you guys hear the panel okay? No, no, no. no, no. no. We need to do more yeah. So the growers are asking some good questions over here. So they asked uh, if there are some area of concern with Valor uh, when you begin to incorporate that into, into your systems. Uh, you know, it's labeled on uh, our pulses for the most part. Um, there are some plant fat restrictions with wheat. So all timing after you harvested your wheat and going into a fallow is probably the safest timing for that particular herbicide. Um, we have tried spring emergence, spring applications of fallow too. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to see the value in that application timing. Um, and there is a little more inherent risk. But um, at the same time, I think Valen's also trying to figure out how to get that carryover reduced. I'm not sure if they're confident they have. I think they might be able to deal with the tool. So the other option would be sharpen. It has a much uh, shorter rotation interval for most um, times. I wouldn't necessarily use it in the fall. I don't think it has anything in the fall. But um, having sharpened a tank with glyphosate uh, in the spring really, um, what, you know what it does? It, uh, it accelerates glyphosate. So instead of taking three or four weeks to kill, that maybe chamomile, that maybe chamomile might be dead in as little as a week. And uh, it's, a, it's a different approach. You have to use MSO and uh, keeping those sorts of things in mind is important for incorporating some of those tank mixed options. And those are both PPO inhibitors, which is a rather uh, odd chemistry process. It's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a different reaction, quite a bit different from what we used to use. appropriate problem now with this uh, tank mix. You, you talked about it a little bit with Roundup and some of the things you might mix with an antagonism. In the university, do you see antagonism? If the tank mix, say, 240 or Mando or Roundup, and if you spray them separately, not tank mix at the same time, do you cross that, or is the antagonism actually the plant? And do you need to have a window? Because I've seen it all three ways in my work. Sometimes if I spray them five days apart, I do a lot better gel, and I can split the tanks. What do you thought? And bang them. So the question was quite long and concerned a lot of different aspects of the antagonism. Hopefully everyone could hear it okay. Mm -hmm. Just hurt. Um, I don't care. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, antagonism, antagonism occurs. It's usually weed specific. Um, when I'm dealing with crypto less, uh, 2,4-D plus 5 states is absolutely the wrong decision um, in general. Um, it, but for other weeds, um, perhaps for a Russian thistle, maybe a low dose of 2,4-D might actually be synergistic. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know that many of you are not dealing with prickly lettuce, so um, the 2,4-D glyphosate tank mixture, in my mind, is for the most part obsolete and unreliable. Um, it's going to be impossible to buy by Canva. Um, so the other option would be maybe an MCPA um, mixture there as an alternative, but even that is, I would put that in the same category as the 2,4-D. Um, I don't know enough about how to make 2,4-D synergistic on certain weeds yet. That's something that's really kind of been a background line of research. Dave, you want to do that? Again, it's, 
<clears throat> truly case by case. I agree with you on the, the monoxies. They're essentially obsolete, almost a crop too. Now. Um, you know, Sharpen is a great tool, but uh, I view Sharpen as a kind of a risky tool. Um, if you go early in the year with Sharpen, you have to plan on following it up with another shot. So what you're going to do, <coughs> kind of let it extremely effective on at certain times of the year. But early in the year, what you do is you, you fry it so quickly that it doesn't provide a complete kill. So after 10 days, 12 days, you start to see another sprig of growth. Well, then you're really in for it because you're not going to be able to glyphosate at that point. So you got to go back with Sharpen again. So you got two shots of Sharpen, a lot of expense. Then you're going to start missing other weeds with those applications like uh, Tome 50. So it's a, a hard weed to kill generally, but you're shifting kind of the, the species to, you know, after, after that second application of Sharpen, you got to go back to a straight life saver, or maybe a night camp thing, a straight life saver, because that's normally when you're starting to get hot and dry. And that's when the tenders is really getting caught in the Sharpen, the, the other place that works really well is, uh, if all you have left out there is China lettuce, and it's hot and dry, that's when it does probably its best. Okay. You were saying you're not going to get buy that camera. You're saying put it back in. Well, <laughs> so. when you can get that camera. We have about half the supply that we'd like to have. And that's just the reality of uh, resistance, so life safe resistance and farm health is what's right. You can get too far to get it. Very hard to get. It's a supply issue, it's not a, a labeling issue. Okay. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Well, to hope if everyone goes, if I keep this thing on time, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to go through and finish up some of the questions as well. Next up, I have Bill Jepson. This is Bill right here. And this guy over here is not Bill as well, but that's Bill. But this is a Bill's farm. <laughs> so I happened to steal some pictures when we took a tour down at Bill's farm back in 2005. And so I'm going to surprise him with some of the pictures I took. So if he looks surprised and stuff, there's a reason for it. Thanks, Aaron. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, yeah, Aaron asked me to send just a few pictures in, and I realized maybe I should have sent a few more in, so I might just... No, you're that's, fine. That's, that's a new one to me here. First of all, I farm in northeastern Oregon. You can see the little Jepson farm there. Uh, it's about 50 miles south of... Uh, Hermiston, and we formed about 4,500 acres. Uh, we started no-till farming in 1997, or Greg then, and we put the entire farm in in 1999, and we've been at it ever since. As far as history goes, um, do you have the rainfall pictures in there? They're next. They're next. Yeah. Okay. I think they're probably weeds. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and we'll go ahead and go through the weeds. Right now, and I, gosh, you know, if you only want to list three, that's hard because we've got more than three that are a real problem. So I kind of divided them into two. <coughs> of course, the Russian thistle, prickly lettuce, and the next one would be Maristale. Those are probably our first three most problem weeds. We look at the Kim Fallow, what's the number? We had one weed as far as population in the Kim Fallow right now. That would be tumble pig weed. But it's very easy to kill, so I don't list it in the tongue. The top three. And of course on the other side our, our real problem reads with grassy uh, grassy annuals and would be cheap grass, go grass, and to a smaller extent, round tail pesky. Our rainfall is about 12.34 inches, and they're gonna get most of a rain just like everybody else in the Pacific Northwest during the uh, winter time. And here is September through August 31st is what I use for a crop here, all the way from 1963 on up to 2010 there. And you can see it's all over the board. We've been down clear as low as under seven and as high as 18 and a half. And you know, when we get about 13, 14 inches of rain, we can do a pretty good job raising crops. We can do a pretty good job raising annual crops. But when it gets down into the seven, eight, nine inch rainfall, it gets tougher and tougher. As far as my sprayer goes, I have a Miller Nitro. It's an older one. Uh, we bought it uh, one year old in 2001. It's got a 90-foot boom on it. Uh, I've got it divided into seven sections. We've got the auto boom section control. We've got the auto steer and, of course, auto rate control. And as far as the nozzle, uh, for the most part, I use an, uh, still pretty much 801, twos, and fours, uh, regular uh, XR flat fan. 
we don't have any other crops of the cereals around us, so there has been a real problem. We also use a weed seeker sprayer for our after harvest and for late summer application. Uh, it's a little 40 foot unit that we pull with a motor tractor. We just still use that quite a bit. Our drill, uh, I have a 40 foot conserva pack drill. It's one of the older ones. It was new in 1997. Uh, we've got a, uh, and it's got an older 2320 Mexico air car. We use all dry fertilizer, uh, primarily urea based, urea and sulfur. Most the only uh, fertilizer chemicals that we use. And I do have a variable rate set up on there, so it's an electric motor that runs the fertilizer side of that, and that runs uh, the variable rate with, with our fields now. And there's the picture of the opener. Of all the chisel openers, I still like the conservative pack real well because it's, it's probably the least disturbing of all the chisel openers. That front shank's only 5 eighths of an inch wide. The seed is placed behind and a little bit off to the side. And then the seed depth is set by the press width so that uh, the seed depth control is pretty good. Now I we have is a cleaner R62. And uh, I, I'm probably about the last guy in the Northwest, I think, that still has an air reel on front of that thing. But <laughs> we get along with it pretty well. And we've been happy with it, and so we're still using it. And then, for as far as residue control, the main thing, first of all, we start with the combine. We've got a chaff spreader on there and a chopper. And this year, we, we've never been happy with that old leaner chopper, and we sped it up some this year, so we'll see if it chops straw a little bit better. We use mowing for the stubble this fall, and we uh, we have a rotary harrow. We don't use it very much, but at times when you're seeding and, and your residue is marginal and you're getting straw balls coming off to the sides, it's a, it's a good tool to break up the straw balls, spread them around, <coughs> little mobiles we call them. But it's not a good tool at all. If you've got tall stubble, you don't want to run a rotary harrow to it. It's probably the worst thing you can do because it breaks the stubble off and lays it down. Okay, we're talking about how many glyphosate applications per year. For us, that's our primary herbicide. And one of the key things, we always start in the fall. Once we get it green up, we get out there and, and spray in the fall. And that is fun. Um, for us, that's typically November. This year, the first week of November, we were out spraying. And when you spray in November, you can use a very small dose. And, and I have neighbors that go put down 13, 14 ounces yet, but we use a spray 20. The next spray, and then this is, you talk about tricks or timing things. Rat tail fescue was a real problem for us. How can we tell us about this? It's not working very well, at least the applications we do. When we spray in the fall, that allows us to delay the first spraying in the spring to when rat tail heads out. If you spray fresh, happy, healthy rat tail, when it's just heading out, you can kill it with 35 ounces of glyphosate. It does a real good job. So we time our spraying in the spring is when the rat tail heads out. Typically at my elevation, that's about the first week of May. So you're up here, up here, we look for the rat tail to head out, as soon as it heads out, we take off and start spraying. Here we've got a couple weeks to get our spring. The next spring would be the midsummer spring, and uh, I look back in the last few years, that's typically the first and second week of July, and we routinely go with a half a gallon, 64 ounces of glyphosate, and in our area, that just proved pretty, pretty common. Uh, and then the, the last thing is you always have some breakthroughs of different weeds you need to clean up, and that's where we use the weed seeker, and that's usually after harvest, we use the weed seeker. Sometimes the fields are pretty clean, you need to use a four-wheeler. Uh, but we normally don't do any broadcast spray later in the summer. And then, of course, the final one would be a pre-plant spray. You know, in a lot of years, it's dry, and you end up, you don't get a chance to have. If you do, uh, it's a nice thing. This year, you know, this last year, we had a chance to uh, get some good, good kill in, in, in the fall. Because we had a whole September range we had. Is that the last one? Or are you small? No. Okay. <laughs> it's not hard. Yeah. Our technology is so much more. Yeah, it's just more fun. It's just more fun. It's just more fun. Where's Jack from the camp? One of the things Aaron talked about was stress and glyphosate application. One of the things we always do when we're applying glyphosate is use ammonium sulfate. We never spray glyphosate without ammonium sulfate. And that's, you know, the 10 to 17, actually we use 10 to 15 pounds per 100 gallons of spray. We spray all of our spray pretty much at 6 gallons per acre. 
We used to go higher in the summer and thought that was helpful, and after reading all the research, we would get them up and stay, stay with a six gallon rate. Uh, for that July application, dust is always a problem, so we go back and put an 8001 nozzle on the sprayer, slow down to four and a half miles an hour, forcing you to stay at four and a half miles an hour, and we actually do a pretty good job with that. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of, oh, there's a million different types of surfactants and, and spray additives you can add. Uh, the biggest thing I think we found out is that it's important to have slightly acidic water, but it isn't real critical to have it real acidic. So we like to run with a great pH of about five and a half to six. And rather than buy expensive products, I just use, I buy a concentrated 18 molar sulfuric acid. We put 500 cc's in a 2,000 gallon tank and that'll bring the pH down to 5.5. Uh, and that uh, just costs pennies. So that's been helpful. And then as far as surfactant, even though we've used primarily, primarily generic glyphosate and you buy the fully loaded product, you're really not sure exactly how much is there, what product it is, uh, we always add two quarts per hundred gallons of surfactant. And there again, we'll spray that in six gallon mix. As far as what well, he's still working on, biggest concerns, you know, the obvious ones, like Mark says, we rely on glyphosate way too much. And if we had two or three resistant weeds, we'd be in a world of earth right now. Uh, so that's number one. And maybe the weed seeker would help alleviate that because we can use expensive type tank mixes and still uh, make it work. One of the things that we put in the weed seeker lately, we use Husky with it. Husky and, and uh, glyphosate seem to work pretty good together for some harder to kill uh, weeds, especially works better on prickly lettuce. And prickly lettuce, you guys know, once it bolts, it's really tough to kill. Or if you dig it, it's just almost impossible. The other thing is evaporation. rotations. You know, our rotation for the most part is summer. We get basically a, a no-till fallow using herbicides. I want to make sure I say that right. Yes. And we would love to have some alternate, alternate crops. Uh, and that might even help weed pressure problems. You know, I hear all of cover crops is one of the things that I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic in the rainfall that we have on cover crops, but we're certainly going to get one fire in the next few years. <laughs> Still working on it. Uh, is there, are there any questions? Maybe I need to be quiet so I get the other two guys going here. I guess they can. Might have, they might have a couple of points I get your question. What are your seeding dates? Seeding dates, if I could pick a seeding date in the fall, it would be September 15th, September 20th. You know, most years, September's the third grass month of the year. Most years, it's still summertime. Now. And so, we do a lot of seeding. If we, if it absolutely refuses to rain, we get into about the second week of October, usually we'll start dusting again. As far as spring seeding goes, we do quite a few annual spring crops, especially after wet winters. We usually seed just as early as we can get in the field, and most of the time that's about the end of our work. Yes, I heard. What's your theory with the less gallons when you're spraying that seed? Well, maybe a more concentrated droplet. Maybe somebody else at the spray expert could say that. We always thought, my goodness, if we're in the summertime, it's hot and it's going to evaporate. We need more gallons per acre to do a better job. And then everything I read says, no, no, no. Our spray pilot has gone from, he always sprays at three gallons per acre, always sprayed at least five in the summer. Now in 80, 90 degree weather, he's out there spraying at three gallons per acre and it still does a real good job. I, that's my guess, but maybe the spray, spray drop of concentration is more important. Maybe somebody else has an answer. Do you find the real small nozzles wouldn't be an issue where you have to quit where you don't want to No. You know, we used to quit when it was about 80 degrees, too. We think all we can spray it when it's above 80 degrees out. This year, we were spraying in, in July the thistles. We had a lot of rain, so the thistles were healthy. They were actively growing, and so was the tall pigweed. They, they were almost overnight, like I said, they were doubling the size. And we just couldn't quit. So we sprayed it. 99, it never hit 100, but it hit 99 several days when we were out there spraying. Oh my gosh, that's the work. Beautiful. One of the best spray jobs we ever had. And I think not so much because of the heat or lack of heat. In that case, it's lots of heat. It's the fact that the thistles were actively growing and they had started to stress here. When you start spraying thistles that are starting to stress, that's when it gets really tough to kill. And we think that that might push us to maybe spray our thistles a little bit earlier. We said, wait and wait and wait for the last of the month. Two months, maybe half the month, a little bit earlier in the summer. Uh, jump to the panel now. <clears throat> we'll talk about you know 
looking at the spray program as no tile management and stuff, what would be some of the strengths of this program? Larry helped design it, so he has, says it's perfect. Bill has a lot of strengths, right? He doesn't have any weaknesses. He's just doing an awful good job. Mike. Yeah, the only uh, thought that comes to my mind is you've got a weed sinker bill that's 40 feet wide, and, and I, I sure you wish that it was wider, um, and I guess that's probably because the nozzles are so expensive. You know, I wish we had one that was about 60 feet wide. And the weed sinker, it's an interesting tool. We use it a lot, and we spray, spray, spray with it, we cuss it a lot because it's not perfect, but it has been a good tool for spraying sporadic big weeds. So it works good in that asymmetric application, and it works good for after harvest. We'll drive around the southern fields and pick up this and that. And I think that's necessary technology as it becomes more and more important to use uh, different chemistries in more expensive compounds. Uh, so it would be nice to see that technology improve and become more affordable. I think Ian wanted to say something there too. <laughs> I actually want to know how fast you're driving. Your weed sinker? Yeah. We're going about uh, just under five miles an hour. Okay, so if you do a little bit of reading, uh, Purdue University got one of these things in the back of a truck and got it out on the run. That tool will hit a dime size spot at 60 miles an hour. Yep. Uh, railroad <laughs> uses them, they, they used to use them at a fast speed and they had to move the nozzle. You know, they had to move the nozzle so there was more of a light time, but you could probably feel it couldn't sit the tractor to right. <laughs> kick up a tremendous amount of dust. And you're out there spraying when it's pretty dry dust. Yeah, but it's really August after harvest over. It's, it's an amazing tool. Uh, the, the technology's out there, that's what's frustrating. To make a perfect weed seeker. I know that. And, uh, but the, the demand is there. They probably put the dollars in there. Really. And they've been frustrated by that. The glyphosate costs is largely to that particular technology. Interesting tank issue, you might want to try with Diagon and Aeropop mixed together for Russian missile control. Late season. That's interesting. I'm always shy away stuff. from Aeropop because of its toxicity. I might yeah, have understand it completely, but it, uh, as a late season part of Russian missile, is far superior to glyphosate. And it's all horrible through the weed season. Only in the weed season, you guys have it. Yeah, you won't be able to do it. If you like to spray the you can't. Know, you can't. Okay, I'm going to jump quickly to, do you have any quick comments? Oh, sorry, what about a weakness? If you look at this program and stuff, what would one of the primary weaknesses be of this program? Or once, or twice? Too much life, I say, like I say, as a number one, and it's just there right in front of all the time. Using the husky. Yes, that might be you. Oh. You should use the husband because I think that's a good idea too. And maybe you can try something else out. You know, there's a reason why I can't use the match in the valve. Um, so for some reason I'm drinking. Throwing that in the tank of my estate, you might have to do necessary scouting. You're not spraying glasses uh, in the middle of the summer. There's no reason to have necessarily to have a life state in the tank. So if you know what you know, so you can do it. Um, you can target specific species when they're up. Well, I might add, when we use the weed seeker, we put a gallon for right. the equipment. Okay. We're going to jump in. I thought you blocked the screen. <laughs> okay, I'm Rob Diebold. My wife thinks I uh, think outside the box, but we'll see here. Uh, we farm at Ritzville and north of Davenport. Ritzville is a eight to nine inch rainfall on a good year. Down course, hopefully 14, 12, 14 inch. I guess I'm jumping ahead. Uh, at home there, we started uh, direct seeding in 2000. Uh, went the whole farm at Ritzville in the chem follow in 2005. My main weeds are Russian thistle, China lettuce, yellow salsify, mare's tail. I guess you can see a pin drop there in Woodsville. It's, we're, we're about four and a half miles north of the Lind Experiment Station, south of I-90, two and a half miles. Uh, let's see here, sprayer. We've got an Apache 
twelve twenty plus two with one hundred twenty foot aluminum boom. Uh, I agree along with Mark. Uh, weight out there, you can't believe how much weight you get with boom whip uh, with a steel boom. Weight up on a steep side hill, it's uh, aluminum doesn't throw the us. Okay, drill fifty four foot per go. Hole drill, it's a 58, 10, uh, 12, 26 inch spacing. Uh, cards homemade, courtesy of Agro and I. Uh, I guess that bottom picture there is showing. I do use this drill, it's got mid row banders on it. Uh, in the fall, I'll take my seat points off and I'll mid row band my nitrogen and sulfur for the next year's spring crop. Uh, chem follow, the fertility is put down with the mid row banders. Uh, I'll dribble uh, phosphate seed or liquid phosphate on with the seed. Uh, it's a narrow knife point about three quarters of an inch wide with a three and a half inch wide steel packer. Springtime I take those points and pack those off and run a five inch wide Kyle opener. Basically a splattered shotgun seed with a five and a half inch wide flat pneumatic packer wheel. Mid row banders are up, and all my fertility goes down below the seed. That point will go about two inches below the depth of the seed, so we get a little bit of disturbance below the seed, and that's where the fertility is at. Uh, I will put the mid row banders down on steep side hills just to keep the drill on. Residue management, uh, I totally agree with everybody. The best thing you can do, or probably the most important thing you can do, is check to see if your chaff is being spread as even as possible. Then you can see how much wheat is going on the ground. Uh, red combines, green combines, they go with you some uh, This year, I finally got my wife convinced to let me have my own personal stripper. And, uh, and, and, and the only thing she doesn't like about it is she can't keep up. She doesn't like to unload over seven miles an hour. So, so that is one thing with a stripper header, you will be looking for another bank out wagon more trucks because you'll be driving twice as fast in your combine and some you know you want to get weed out of the field because you're cutting faster. It looks like NASCAR on the cover. Well back to resume management. There are some of the strip winter wheat stubble at home. Uh, and then of course there's a picture, I don't know if you can see the difference in the bottom right hand corner. On the right side that has already been fertilized and coming back towards me has not, so you cannot tell where you go. That's, and I mean, still running the steel pack wheels on the ground in the back, but that's just the mineral banners put down the fertilizer. So trying to leave a bigger, taller, longer windbreak to catch snow, break the wind, shade. Can I see through that? We're going to find out. Oh boy, here we go. We got. To, I am outside the box. Uh, at Ritzville, on the home place, I'm raising winter peas, winter canola, winter triticale, some winter wheat, and spring barley. And my winter crop's going on the barley ground. That's what you used in the strip right here. Yeah, this year that's, I stripped all my barley. And so I did strip some winter wheat just to see if I could seed it next spring. I don't know. It's going to be interesting with the hoe drill. I cheated. I cut around the outside four rounds and all my draws out with the draper header because usually where you plug up is where you double, try to double seed, do out your ends or do out your draws. You have to see that better draw. Uh, the barley stubble, you know, barley doesn't get as tall, doesn't get as thick at Redsville. We raise, you know, usually a ton to ton and a quarter of barley. It's not the greatest thing, but there's a reason people raise barley and I'm finding out. Uh, I think it'll be easy to see through the logo. Okay, glyphosate. Typically, you know, we're about 96 ounces, maybe a little bit over that. Um, I'm, I'm like Bill or Mark, if we get any kind of rain or any little inkling of green in the fall, you spray. I mean, you turn your sprayer off and wait till next spring and see which, you know, if you didn't think there was anything there. Applications were three, we usually spray three times, plus the fall one if need be. Um, here we go, outside the box again. 
If an airplane can put on three gallons of ink and fly at 90 miles an hour and 10 feet above the ground, I can do it at 15 miles an hour and 36 inches off the ground. It works great. I don't like to stop to fill and put on water. You can use a lot better uh, um, surfactant package. You know, it doesn't cost as much because you're treating it 100 gallons of water. You're not treating, you know, per acre cost. Yeah, you're going to stand there a little longer, put 100, 120 gallons of Roundup in your sprayer, but you'll have to stop on this price today. Application timing, earlier the better. Cannot emphasize this, especially in dry country. If you find Russian thistles and if they're softball size, I'm too late. I don't want to come back at lunchtime and find them as a, as a basketball. If they're out there and they're the size of your fist, you better be spraying. I'll spray twice versus waiting to try to get one more flush because if you wait, it's too late. If you spray and you don't get them, there is a chemical that works really good. It's called home marks. <laughs> or my dad and my wife and my daughter and my kids and myself. It's, it's us and a hoe. And I will not let a weed on steroids go to seed. I mean, if you spray and you can't kill them, we're out there home. I envy Bill Jepson. I went down there with Aaron, you know, Nine, ten years ago, a weed seeker, I loved to have one. My weed seeker is a four wheeler and a lot of hose. You know, I hope weeds in summer fall and off horseback and all that. Kim falls a piece of cake. You can drive around on a four wheeler, get your dad a side by side, and turn loose. <laughs> Don't let him go to seed because that's where you end up in resistant varieties. <clears throat> Tough to kill varieties of Russian thistle because you spray them once or twice and then they go to seed. Uh, tank mixes, uh, I guess I'm all kind of like everybody else. I've tried a little band bill, you know, I've tried a little 24 d with it. Uh, I've even put Paraquat in with it certain times of year. Um, when it's hot and dry, a little Paraquat and Roundup's not a bad thing. I will tell you one thing, that's a big, big wreck. Do not use Paraquat and Roundup early in the spring. Because it will shut your roundup down, and then we go back to spray that plant again. You will not kill it. Not a good deal. That was two years ago. Uh, about for your water, I use Loadout. I've been very, very happy with it. I don't use any dry products. I don't like the bags. I don't like the time and the mess. Uh, like I say, I use one quart per hundred gallons of water. When it starts getting warm and a little drier out, we'll go to two quarts. Uh, what else I say? There's hot dry weeds or moisture stress. I screw over here we go outside the box again. I like to spray from sun up. I don't know, I've got a neighbor that tries to beat me all the time and he usually does, but we try to spray it as early as possible in the morning. I mean when the sun comes up and we'll spray until about 7 or 8. Get all my borders sprayed. You know, technology is great. And then you go back out there at 11 o'clock at night and you spray till 8 the next morning. I have my best luck spraying Russian thistle in July at night. Dust isn't a problem. The weeds are open back up. They're trying to take in humidity. If they're taking in humidity, they're going to take in my chemical. In the middle of the day when they're shut down and trying to keep you dehydrated, they're not going to take the chemical. Uh, you know, the question was about high gallonage or low gallonage. Dean Brown told us years ago, he was a Monsanto rep, that anytime you can shoot a stronger bullet or roundup or a plant, you're going to have control. So you, you take, you know, I mean, I'm 33% stronger solution than you are 10 gallons. If you're putting water in, all you're doing is dilute your chemical. Sure, you might get a little better coverage. I use, to do that, like I said, I spray 15 miles an hour. I'll use an 001, 110 degree 001 tip. It is an XR. I use a, a green leaf technology nozzle. It has a, a venturi, an air venturi, that actually meters that 01 amount of chemical, and then it's induced and pushed through an 02 tip. And it's a flat fan tip. Uh, we've got good fine droplets. Drift is a little bit of a problem if it gets windy. I do use. Drift retardant products, not saying they're the solution. I've tried AI nozzles, and it's the worst spray job I've ever had, and I do have some air mix nozzles. I've got a five-way turret on there, and I'm switching nozzles all the time. I might turn the air mix nozzles on. 
on the outside edge of the boom going around the field next to sensitive crops, your neighbors, the, you know, the road or whatever, wife's garden, you know, and then once you get in the field, you go flip them back out and go to all your flat fans. Just an option. Uh, Roundup resistant and Roundup resistance. That's my concern. I I don't like to use the word chemicals either, but I'm chemical dependent. And I don't like going to AA meetings. I don't know what we're doing. I mean, paraquat's an option. I, I don't know. That's why I'm trying all these alternative crops. I played with cover crops. I mean, I think there's something to crop competition. The more residue you can leave on the ground, the more even it is, you will have less weeds. I mean, there's research to show that. One other thing we found in the dry desert is Russian thistles don't find phosphate. You take our south hillsides where there's alkaline, very minimal of any organic matter, and we're conventionally farming, we had Russian thistles with no meat crop. Now we've got a nice solid stand of stubble and some wheat and very few Russian thistles. I don't know what it is, it's magic. Some things I call FM. <laughs> Strings on outside the box. It just is a good one. He's not scared to try stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Goose. <laughs> try it. Columbus took a chance. You're never going to learn unless you try it. The best, best thing you'll ever learn or remember is when you learn from the seat of your pants. You won't forget. You, know, you come down here, you learn all this information, it's really great. You go home two days from now, you're going, God, what did they all talk about? Go try something. Man. Throw something in with your wheat and your seed. Throw peas in with your canola and your seed. Try something. Try a cover crop. I mean, we waste moisture in our summer fall, our chemical fall. You know, we're in an eight inch rainfall zone, and we might have four inches of seeding time. That's poor chemical. Rod, you seem to be pretty fond of the barley uh, in the rotation. But what are your thoughts there? Well, when the price of barley's up, you know, about $100 a ton, you might not make much this year, but I think you're going to see the benefits in the, you know, the next crop following that is where we see the benefit. Um, like I said, I raised a lot of triticale too, and that's, you know, you're breaking up disease. We've been in a 125-year cycle of winter wheat or spring wheat and summer fall. There's some auto course where it's a rack. Not saying that barley is not a cereal, but there's something different to it. Why do the guys in the blue country raise barley after their wheat? You know, they started peas and barley kind of run away or lentils. Away. Guys in Montana are doing it. You, you got, I, I'm in a one third, two thirds rotation. So two years out of three, I got something growing on that ground. That's better than every other year for the rest of my life. I want to get to where there's something growing on the ground all the time. What it is, I don't know yet, but we're going to get there. Uh, switch gears just for a minute to uh, obviously you apply phosphorus. Do you do that every year? Yes. Especially especially in the fall and especially in the spring. So yes. I don't I don't put my canola. But the reason for it is in the springtime, we need to get quicker, faster root growth out because we're limited on our days. I mean we'll try to seed, you know, first part of March. And a lot of times it'll rain. It turns off hot crack. We need a root system. In the fall. It doesn't really give you much of a benefit, except if you have a winter like we're having right now. If you get a cold snap, a healthy plant, a lot stronger root system seems to make right out that cold spell. I call it end freeze. Okay, and I'm not really talking about strengths, Aaron, but um, I just had a lot of questions for it. Now, what are your thoughts on variety selection when you're, you know, planting later than you might like it to be? Like change wheat, wheat varieties? Yeah, you change Oh, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll take and change varieties. I don't know. For wheat, I've been, I don't know, I guess I'm a lot on my wheat. I've been pretty happy with Brio. It's one that doesn't go to sleep. It's not real winter hardy. But why is that? That way it takes off and goes good in the spring. Um, if it gets very late, I'll take and use winter traded Kaylee because its parents are rye and wheat. It takes off and it'll it'll catch up and outgrow anything you got. I have played with seeding dormant seeding spring wheat in the fall. I'm not recommending it, but it does work. You know, Getsy went down there and learned from Larry a lot. I think it's Getsy, isn't it? I don't know if you guys are still doing that, but the Gets. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of spring wheat heritage in it. And it can grow quickly in the spring and get up and going, uh, especially when you plant it late in the fall. Its downfall for us has been its susceptibility to strike rust. Uh, Norwest Y53, if you're growing hard red winter wheat uh, in our area, uh, it's a little warmer there. It's a good option for late planting, uh, but it is also quite susceptible to the cold, so you need to be careful with that. Uh, so if you're in a situation where you're planting later than you would like to be, I think it makes sense to consider varieties uh, like Ketsi or 553, but remember a lot of those varieties have some spring wheat in their background, uh, and that makes them more sensitive to the cold. So experiment on small acreages uh, at first. What's going to be his weakness? <laughs> so spraying at night is cool. That's a really good thing to do. Uh, there's a lot it of is cool out too, then. <laughs> there's a lot of the stuff that's there's a lot of the biology that's going on that's enabling your success at night. And I, there's other things that can happen at night too, uh, like like planting. Oh yeah, we I, I learned to seed around the clock. I mean, that's, yeah. to hide around days and dad around nights, and then we got switching. You know, and that, that's, that's largely over, overlooked. I mean, in this day and age, we got all the technology to keep us on track, and all the guidance. You know, even that that passage of the plant or green soil, that brief <coughs> light flash during the day that stimulates seed seed see germination. Night, you don't need that. <clears throat> well, yeah, you want to make sure you have the right color light bulbs. <laughs> there you go, no HID lights received at night. Even that was too much. What about weaknesses? Send our later spray in the night, you're going to kill your toe. This next story. <laughs> You'll probably run into an inversion at some point. Yeah. But you know that's why I say you go you know you go spray your sensitive areas or your borders early in the morning you know, you know before you know stay away from the sensitive stuff at night. I'm not saying you know just don't go out and spray every acre at night, but pick and choose. It's just like your weediest ground. Spray that with flat fans when it's calm. If you've got fields that aren't too weedy, you know you can try your mouth for a little bit. Anything else? Don't ever mix paraquat ground. I found that. Out. Questions? We got like minus one minute for questions. <coughs> Chris? Well, I don't want to ask you a stripper of those holes now, but you live in a borrowed time. Did you have a question all the rest of the year here down in our operation? What differences do you see in the feed spectrum and the time of the Well, the reason I didn't jump into much of the app work is chemical. I've never had a chemical at that work. It's always been an annual crop. You know, so we got different different ball game there. Otherwise, yeah, we go there too. And and I'm a horror frost. I'm a frost. Well, I like to catch as much frost as I can. Any more questions? Any more questions? Not like the horse rivers came questions that you guys have um, from the panel. Um, we're running a couple minutes against lunch. I hate to do that. This hour goes fast, especially for the uh, dark computer. But anything else that I that I skip? Panel? Yes? I just got a question for the panel. There's been all this talk about the stuff we can add to the water and condition the water, but if you're just doing some roundup, what is the purpose mix of water for <laughs> What's the best water conditioner? Is that what you're asking? No, not, not the product wise, but I mean, we all start with different well waters. So oh. what is, what do we want to end up with chemically to have the right mix, quote unquote, of, of spray water to mix the ground? Like the PA, where you type well, of PA? Well, you need to test your water and water. Here we are, comment right. Call man, uh, back east, a lot of them catch the water off the roof, so the barn. Tank out there, and they get all their rainwater, so they have that rainwater as the best. But we have at home, we've got one well at five and a half, six feet 
engaged. And that's the well we use because they've done a better job than the ones that are seven. I like that. So a little bit lower pH. Huh? You're saying that the pH with water with pH of five to six or seven. It's not all pH. It's what's in the water. Water calcium is our biggest issue. Yeah, you got a lot of minerals. Uh, another little point I learned at McGregor, uh, they have some test plots with different surfactants. And there is a difference in surfactants. There's one that I can't remember. I just, I got my quad guy. I'm the only one he gets that in for. So I can't tell you what it is. But anyway, it's better than those others that they really try to set it. I don't like the oil on the back side of it, but I like that. It's called a 90 something. If you call uh, Steve up there the trade with coal bags, he can take it. Yeah, I don't know. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's a good first I'll try to say something different now. And that's the only, and that gives you 97 percent control, I believe. What is this good thing about your bag? One thing I, I always wonder, there's so many out there, and they always got different names, and they're always changing. What, there's a guy either in North or South Dakota that does research on it, and I've talked to him several times, maybe some of you guys have, I can't remember his name. He said of all the surfactants they've tried, what they do is they use like, you know, one ounce per acre glyphosate rates, spray a sublethal dose, and then use a surfactant to see the difference. And he said, of all the surfactants, R11 was the best one they ever found. But he said the difference between R11 and the super cheap ones was small enough that he didn't figure it was worth the cost difference. So we buy the cheapest we can buy. I think the one I'm using now is called Insist 90. And it doesn't have much oil in it. It's mainly alcohol. And if you read it, it'll be something like alkyl or aryl ethoxylate. That's actually your surfactant part. And we use a full two quarts per 100 gallons. And I think that that does the job. So we go with the cheap stuff and use two quarts of it. And then also, I just don't cut the rate. we don't cut the rate on it. And we don't care what's already in the glyphosate, even though we're buying a fully so-called fully loaded product. The other thing is, pH-wise, Monsanto has told me that they felt as long as you have a pH below 6, that that was, that was adequate. And that's why we just use this concentrated sulfuric acid to bring us down to about 5.5. Alan? When it comes to uh, rat tail pescue, have you ever tried using crop oil with your plastic? You I, I haven't because we've been able to kill it, you know, as long as we're doing it as it heads out with just what I was using before. So maybe, maybe somebody else had experience. Yeah, we've looked at different animals on, on rats. Yeah, when it's uh, so much more dependent on the staging growth than it is anything. The, the coverage can play a role. So that would be one instance where I would consider maybe bumping it up to 15 gallon spray because your target is truly, truly your living factor there. Not necessarily the sensitivity of life. I'd like to thank the panel. Um, I really wish I could have had an hour and a half or something here, or two hours. Um, thank you guys, I appreciate it. Um, they're up in front of the room, they can't get to that door very quick, so if you have a question, corner them up here, and they probably won't use the exit. So, thank you guys. Um, thank you so much.